زين انت ولد صغير عفوا يا اخوي في اخبار عن بيت نوبه؟ منطقي مش حكيت؟ مع سلامتك استاذ ناصر بتعامل ابني مثله مثل باقي الاولاد هو مش بمستوى الاولاد الثانيين هو اشطر من باقي الاولاد ليش هيك؟ وين ابوي وينه؟ تتذكر شو حكى لك؟ اتجاه الشمس قلنا لك محل الشمس بتروح كل يوم سبعة تسين بس شفنا ضواب القدس شفناهم قلت ليش انت تزوجتي صغيرة؟ يا ريتني تجوزت اصغر زبيب انت خليتي يروح بغرقوا بسرعة كيف ضيعنا كل شيء؟ ما ضيعناش The film takes place in 1967 uh, in Jordan and it, but it begins with uh, it, a mother and son who have just become uh, refugees um, and they've, they've arrived in Jordan. The film opens when they're already in the camp um, and the boy is, uh, is, is a, he's a special kid. He's, he's, uh, he's very stubborn, smart. Um, he's the kind of kid who asks a lot of questions that adults can't answer. Um, in a way that satisfies him and he doesn't understand they've been split up from the father in the whole chaos of war um, and so he doesn't understand logically how the father is supposed to find them in this refugee camp in the middle of nowhere where just simply their names are registered and nobody really knows where they are um, and also logically if you know if you walked from your village to this camp why can't you just walk back um, he doesn't understand borders or why suddenly Somebody tells you you can't go here anymore. Um, so it's this, it's the story of the mother and son at this period in the late 60s, um, and he eventually decides to leave um, himself, take it upon himself to find the father, and the mother, you know, le having Tarek as the only only thing left in her life, of course, follows him. And dot dot dot. <laughs> Are you reluctant to say more about it? I don't know if I should or not. Should I, I think you should. It's very important. Yeah. Can well, I? Yeah. You go ahead. Well, just <laughs> I'll, I'll help you out. I mean, what I what I understood from the film is that he finds friendship, family, community, and identity from a group of friendly fedayeen, uh, and uh, he goes to them. Then, yeah. and that is much more grounding for him than the dehumanizing experience of being in a refugee camp. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, in the film, I mean, he's in the camp, and the, and it's just sort of two different mentalities where he feels that in the camp, people are saying we have to wait. We've registered our names. This is what we have to do. We have to wait, um, and he doesn't. He's not that kind of person. He's not the kind of person who waits. So he goes and he finds this group of of fighters, um, and he's not politicized. I mean, he's too young. He's 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 coming of age. He doesn't really understand who they are and what they're doing, but he thinks they're like him. They think like him. He wants to go back home. These guys want to go back home and they're doing something about it. Um, and the mother finds him with this group and is of course, you know, terrified that her her little boy is with this with this group. Um, but she tries to bring him back to the refugee camp and he refuses. He he wants to stay with them so because he's going forward. So they they the f most of the film takes place there with her trying to bring him back to the refugee camp and him trying to go forward. But I think there's this interesting tension, and you capture it very beautifully, very cinematically, without dialogue, uh, between her wanting to take him back to what she thinks is the safe, logical, <coughs> rational place to be, and her heart feeling more identified with the freedom of being in the open space and 
and then when she when when he has run away in the end and they go to follow him there's that moment where you show her this like i don't know epiphany you want to call it or whatever where it seems she understands why he wants to go home when she sees it and i hope i'm not destroying yeah, you know. but you shouldn't say the end. <laughs> I won't say the <laughs> because end. Because a lot of people, I don't think, has no. it, who has seen the film here? Yeah, who hasn't seen the film? Okay, don't ruin the end. We will not ruin <laughs> the end for you. But anyway, I just think that that was a very important moment because you're really showing, you know, the, the tensions that I think Palestinian refugees yeah. felt, you know, I mean, between these different, and it was a, polit a time of political parties, and you showed that very beautifully. Um, I, in fact, I think you kind of showed in a in a very romantic way. That's mm -hmm. yeah. that's cinematic. That's yeah. nice. Uh, yeah, I want. I mean, I, it is romantic, and I wanted to be romantic about it because I am romantic about that period, and they were romantic themselves. I mean, I always say that they, they, to be doing what they were doing, they had to be romantic. They believed they were going to go back. They believed in all these these things were going to happen. Um, and still believe, you know, so I, I, and also, you know, from Tarek's point of view, um, you know, they, they, they were, it was a special time, and, and he felt, like you said, that's a big part of the story, in the, in the refugee camp, he can't read, um, you know, he, he doesn't know how to read, and he's sort of being pushed out, I mean, he doesn't like life in the refugee camp, he doesn't understand why they, he has to stand in line for food, why there are public toilets, why, I mean, it's a lifestyle that doesn't make sense to him, he misses his home, um, not in a political way, in a very basic way. He misses his bed. He misses, you know, that kind of life. Um, and in the refugee camp, he's isolated from things, and he's getting more marginalized. Um, and then these, he finds these guys who, even though they know he can't read, he, don't, they, he can offer something else. Everybody in this group can offers what they can, and nobody's less because they don't have, I mean, so that, that's a big part of him, you know, discovering that, you know, there's, there's community there. Right. Yeah. Um, you said last night in the question and answer after the film that um, you, you talked a little bit about your process of trying to find somebody to play Tarek. Can you talk about that now? Yeah. Um, I mean, t the boy who plays Tarek is, is um, named Mahmoud Asfa. He's from the Irbid refugee camp in the north of Jordan. Um, he's a really amazing kid who's very similar to, to Tarek in the film. Um, He's, uh, I mean, when I, when I, I just say, when we, we had a, this big casting process, 200 kids looking for boys between the ages of 11 and 13. And one thing about him, when I first met him, I, I, I thought maybe he'd read the script. <laughs> <laughs> because he was so much like Tarek. And I asked all the kids, just in casual conversations, when, we, when I was, you know, looking for, for Tarek, um, what they wanted to do when they were older. And they would say normal kid things like, be a doctor, be a, you know, an engineer, be whatever. I mean, all kinds of the answers that kids give. And Mahmoud said, I want to go to Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but OK, but what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, and he said, I want to go to Palestine. And I was like, this kid has read the script. Like, that's, you know, it's like, so he's like that. And he had, I mean, he's, he's, he's a refugee. He's the son of refugees. But he, he has that very clear idea and, and in an amazing way also about his, his own identity. We were rehearsing once in Jordan, um, and this man came up to him. We were I was sort of walking around with him. We were, and somebody said to him, so you're, you know, I said, this, this, you know, he's acting in the film, you know, Batal al-Film, he's the hero of the film. And this man says to him, so are you, um, wh you know, where are you from? He says, I'm you know, from Irbid. And what kind of film is it? And he says, it's a Palestinian film. And the man says, so, but you are, what are you? And Mahmoud says, I'm, you know, I'm, I think he said, I'm Palestinian. Um, and he said, but you were born in Jordan. You've lived all your life in Jordan. Why are you Palestinian? Oh, no, he said, he said to him, what? So this film, you know, is it, so who do you like more? Pal you know, what, who do you like more, Palestine or Jordan? You know, and it was just a weird question to ask a kid. And Mahmoud, without missing a beat, I mean, he just goes, what? He actually said, what, I, what do you mean? I mean, do you ask somebody who you like better, your mother or your <laughs> father? Like, what kind of question is that? I like both. And I was just like, this kid is like 12. I mean, he just, he's like that, so. <laughs> and, and when you said um, last night that you, you worked with him a little bit before you finally decided on him, what exactly did you do to work with him? I mean, we, we did a lot of things. And one, 
one thing that was, was about being physically um, open and, and free, but he, he already was like that in many ways. Like some of the kids, when I was interviewing them, I would ask about music they like to listen to or if they like to dance, and they're boys, and they said, no, they don't like to dance. That's not cool. Except him. He said, I like to dance. And I said, can you show me something? And he said, first he said no, and then he said okay. And then he did the Debke. Um, he's, he's, he's just open. He just, you know, he's not, he's not self-conscious. Um, and working together, we worked on that, being like just acting exercises. Um, a lot of what we worked on, too, was understanding what is home, because he's, he's a refugee that's, you know, he doesn't, he, he doesn't know Palestine. He's never been to Palestine. Tariq in the film knows very clearly what is Palestine. Um, you know, it's, that's part of his trauma is that that's suddenly been taken away from him. So we worked a lot about that concept of home and what is it that the character is so obsessed with returning to that he as Mahmoud as, an, as, a, you know, as a person could connect to for his own role. We drew the house, for example. We like I had him sketch the house, like everything of his lifestyle. The film opens when he's already, you know, when when the character of Tariq is already a refugee. Um, we didn't work. On, I never showed him the script. We didn't work on what happens later, his relationships with people later, except for his mother's rela relationship with his mother. But but everything before that, who is my, who is Tariq? Where does he live? What does his father look like? Because in the film, we never see the father. He's just trying to find his father. Um, we, we actually chose a photograph of a man that became his father. Um, that was just for him. No, nobody else in the film saw that photo. It was his photo. Um, what did the house look like? What did he hear his parents saying at night? Because there's an indication their, their relationship was, you know, there was some problems in the relationship. They used to fight. So what did he hear? How did he feel? I mean, all those kinds of details so that he knew exactly where Tariq was coming from, what Tariq was trying to get back to. And then the work with the mother later, that was really important. Roba Blal, who plays the mother, is a, you know, she's an actress. Um, building their relationship as mother and son, the three of us would work together. And I also let them, a lot of times, just they were off by themselves, go, go to the park, go do whatever mother-child thing so that they could establish this bond. And she was also, as an actress, um, who also works with children, she was very helpful in that, I think, for, for Mahmoud. Yeah, well, one thing I noticed was that all the actors were very convincing. There was not one second, you know, one notices these things when there's just a sense of distance between the, the, the actor and the character or the scene. There, there, was no, there was no unconvincing moment, and I thought she as a mother was, um, she was just a very good choice as an actress. I thought all of your, and I want to ask you, how did you choose the actors for this film besides Mohammed? Roba I had wanted to work with from, from a long time. I'd seen her in other films. Um, Roba Blal plays the mother. I wanted to work with her. I'd seen her in, in films, and I was hoping that she would work with Mahmoud. Um, but I had to, you know, choose Mahmoud first, make sure everything was okay with Mahmoud, and then I put them together, and they, 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 they connected. And, and so that was okay, and uh, I'm very happy for that. In fact, she actually has a son with the same name as him, so and who sort of she thinks looks like him, so so it, it was good. Um, Saleh Bakri, who plays Laith, I've worked with on Salt of the Sea. Um, another person who's who has a lot of experience and and is a, is a great actor. The rest were a mix of actors, mostly from Jordan. Um, some who have a little bit of, of theater experience. Some who are acting for the first time. Um, a lot of them, I didn't know this till, till much later, are the children of the, of the Fedayin. Um, from, and I didn't, I didn't know that till much later in the filming process. And, and that was interesting because like, they were reenacting in a way their parents' lives. And they know, so they knew very well that lifestyle. They knew, they knew all the stories of it. So that, that's something that would help in the backstory for them. And then, yeah, we did training. Like I had all the actors go through um, military training. Um, the, not all the actors, but the ones that were fedayin, because uh, the, they went through a few weeks of, of uh, intensive training because they had to learn, they had to know how to hold a gun, they had to know how to do all this. And crew was welcome to join them, and some crew, like Manal over there, <laughs> joined them in some of the yes. military exercises. <laughs> <laughs> and she was really good. Um, <laughs> But it was a good way to get in shape. Mm -hmm. But yeah, different different things like that. And um, how long did it take you to make this film from the very beginning to the end? 
we we took about three months. Uh, sorry, th three months. I wish, three years, <laughs> from beginning to end. About about three years, um, from writing and raising the financing, which was which was very difficult. And then we didn't have. Um, we were we shot the film with half the budget we were supposed to, or even less. Um, but we had to go. I didn't want to wait. Salt of the Sea, you know, was six years, um, and I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to lose. Tariq, I didn't want him to grow up and, and lose the chance to work with him because um, it would be, I mean, he, he was right at the edge too. Now he's, I mean, his voice has already dropped. He's already, he's, he's changed a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, so from beginning to end. And after we shot, actually, there was a big gap after shooting because we didn't have enough money to complete the film. So we shot and then um, we were in post-production for a long time trying to find the financing to complete it, and finally found it from, surprisingly, Greece. A broke country saved our broke film. <laughs> so, That's yeah. such an irony. Yeah. Um, so what, what could you say in just a few words or a few sentences, okay, not a few words, a few sentences, about ha making this film in Jordan, which is a, you know, and, you know, I understand that you live in Jordan, but, I mean, it's very difficult to make films of this nature in Jordan. So was it, how did you get the permission, for example, to um, shoot scenes of the freedom fighters training, you know, the military training and, and all of this? How did you, I understand that there's a lot of red tape one has to go through. Can you talk a little about that? It, yeah, I mean, it's, I just, I knew it. I mean, everybody knows it's a, it's a sensitive subject in Jordan. And I, I felt it while we were working. Everybody felt it um, while we were working. And in some ways, it was easier, easy to get permission for some things, um, and and sometimes there was there was there was a lot of red tape and bureaucracy to deal with. We kept it really small, and there's also issue of being an independent film in Jordan, which is becoming a place that's really used to very high budget American films shooting in Jordan as as a landscape, as a backdrop, as a you know stand-in for Iraq or some someplace else. So also, we, which it was difficult to, to be able to pay the crew what they are now used to, to getting paid. Um, so there were, there were those kinds of, of difficulties. But I don't know, sometimes it was, it was just surreal. You can say there, like the, when there was one of the days we had that training um, scene, and you have all these like, guys dressed in like, military fatigue and like kafiyas, and they're running through a training circuit with you know, Kalashnikovs that we got from the you know army from the Jordanian army but somebody you know their security had gone by or something in a helicopter and then suddenly there was like tons of helicopters above us and we were in Dibin forest which is the location that the you know Palestinian fighters really were in back in the day so we were like I hope to God they know this is a film shoot because like <laughs> this look probably is like terrifying t from like up in the sky like suddenly there's this like whole training military training circuit going on but <laughs> okay. yeah, it sounds like somebody should have made a documentary about you making the film. Yeah, the insanity <laughs> of it. Um, so let's switch to a different subject now. Um, you've had a lot of experiences, very interesting experiences, and one one experience that I actually would like to ask you about is um, you were an assistant to the Chinese director Zhang Yimou, and that must have been a very interesting and in experience for you. I mean, it's an incredible opportunity, also. And I'm wondering, do you feel like that changed you in some ways or influenced you in significant ways? Can you talk about that? He's, yeah, Zhang Yimou is one of the greatest directors today living, and I'm so lucky to have had a chance to, to get to know him and to see how he works. Um, I went to China for, for those who don't, who don't know me, he did like Raise the Red Lantern and Hero and a bunch of really amazing films. But it was really different. I mean, he works on a completely different scale. I mean, his last film, the one that I was on set, was a, was a $99 million budget, which is the highest budget Chinese film. But I've never, I mean, I, that's like, I mean, we're working like this. And you know, he has 400 people on set. Um, but it was, it was great. And I think, I don't know, I, I'm sure that I'm very affected by him. But I don't know how yet. And he said it himself. He said, you're not going to even know. Maybe in 10 years, uh, something of this experience might mean something, might affect you in a, in a clear way. So I, and, and, I, and for him, I mean, the, the thing is that that's how knowledge is passed down. You will not realize it maybe for many years. And I think that's really true. 
Um, but he's somebody I, I greatly respect how he works. Um, every detail of what he's, he does, I mean, he's visually, he's a, he's a genius. I mean, he's, he's absolutely amazing. I mean, even we were, like, he was shooting a scene. I was the only one allowed on set, allowed to sit next to him. Like, he has a chair, he sits, in the, and the camera person sits, and nobody else is allowed to sit. So I, except for me, because I, I was his guest, I had a chair next to him. So, but we were shooting a scene, and he had, like, a bookshelf, sort of like that bookshelf, in the back of the, of the scene, like, in the background. This is, a, this is a film that takes place in Nanjing in the 1930s. Um, and suddenly he stopped and he said, I need somebody to check those books because they're, they're, they're books in English. I want somebody to check the books to make sure none of them are published after 1930. And so they were like, OK, they started checking it. And he said, Anne-Marie, you know, your English is good. Go over there and check, the, you know, check it. And he thought that was very funny. The Palestinian was like the person in <laughs> on set checking the books you know, in China. Um, anyway, so I went and I checked all the books. And they were all fine. You know, we took out a couple of strange ones, because it's supposed to be in a, in a monastery, um, in a church. We took out some that, some that didn't make sense. And when you see that scene in the film, the books are completely out of focus. They're not, you don't even see them. They're like way in the background, out of focus. But that's how he works. I mean, there's like not a detail goes past him, even if nobody will ever see those books, which you can't. If you watch the movie, it's something way in the background, blurry. Out of, nobody would have ever noticed if one of them was, was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> well, I was wondering if maybe, maybe that your work with him influenced just a tiny bit your visual style. Mm. Because I noticed that there, there are a lot of good, very, you know, really intense close-ups in this film, Lama Shuftak, with the background a little bit out of focus. I know, I mean, perhaps you work very, very closely with your cinematographer. Um, it just seemed to me like this visually Every single, like I said, cinematic aspect of this film was very incredibly tight, incredibly uh, effective. And so I was just wondering if perhaps that work with him might have pushed you, just just like tightened you, tightened the screws in, in you f somewhat. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I did work. I mean, I work very, very closely with Helen Louvard, the cinematographer. Um, she's, she, it's the first time we worked together, and I hope to work with her again and again. It was a really great collaboration. Um, but the style of the film is also really important to, it was, for, for me, it was always Tarek's point of view and the way he sees things, and he, he, he sees details of things. He sees these, you know, ants. He see, I mean, it, it was, and, and to stay really close to, to what's happening with him was a, was a big part of that. Um, you know, t it's, t it's his story, it's his story and, and Reda's story, his mother's story. Um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, that's a lot of also the language was, was trying to be intimate with them as well. Yeah. Um, can you talk about any current project or a future project that you've started to work on or what you would imagine working on next? I would love to. I'm, I'm, st I'm trying to write, but we've been really busy with the, with the film um, because of our current situation of Palestinian cinema, Arab cinema, independent cinema. We also have to distribute the film ourselves. Um, so I haven't really had time to focus on something new, but I do have a new project in mind I'm trying to write. Um, I'm writing a script for another producer and director that I will not direct. I'm just the screenwriter on, um, which I'm not allowed to talk about. And as a director, I, I always write my own scripts, and I, and I love the, the craft of screenwriting very much. But I dream to have a great script put in my hands, something that I can just be the director on and not the writer for the next film. Um, so, and anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be about Palestine. I mean, it doesn't have, if it's a story that, that I feel close to that has this element of, of this human element to it that I, stories about struggle, about, I mean, these are, these are the things that I like. Um, could be a thriller. I'd love to do a good thriller. <laughs> so um, this might segue nicely into the subject of, of teaching, because I noticed that, I mean, you do, you wear many hats as a filmmaker, and one of them is teaching, um, and another one of them is curating. But as, a, as somebody who has taught filmmaking at universities or in refugee camps, uh, what's the most vital uh, aspect of teaching uh, cinema? 
I, I think, I mean, f for me, what I have to think about what I learned, what was good for me to, as in, in learning. I mean, I'm still learning and I'm still always, you know, always learning and trying to improve my craft. But I think what I try to teach is the lessons that I learned, which is really important to trust your own instinct, um, to trust yourself and, and your ability to tell stories and to, I mean, you have to really develop thick skin in this industry, like many other industries. And, and I, I don't know, I think, especially as, as a woman, that's also something to, to be learned that, you know, you, you, you are doubted all the time you have to trust your, your gut. And so I hope that I can teach other people that too, because people will try to kick you down a lot. <laughs> so just, even if it's stupid, just, you know, even if it's wrong, even if it's your mistake, go with what you feel is, is the way to do it. And then you'll know if it was a mistake later yourself, not if somebody else tells you that. And as a, a woman film director, um, Recently, I read an interview with you in The Independent where you said you made something, some kind of statement about it being somewhat of a burden having to represent all of Arab womanhood. I actually understand where you're coming from. I do. But can you clarify that a little bit more? Because while that is a burden, it's also important that you take the credit for that because there aren't very many women feature film directors in the world and there are not very many coming from the region that you come from. So, so just clarify that and talk about the nuances and the, the tensions of that. Well, I think what that I was talking about is that, yeah, the burden, I don't represent anything. None of the characters represent or symbolize anything except their, who, their characters. Tariq only represents Tariq, for example. He doesn't, rec he doesn't represent Palestinians. And that's something I think, but I, but I know where it comes from too, like with our community, the Palestinian community, there are so few Palestinian films out there that when somebody sees a Palestinian film, they want it to rep they want you, you know, to tell the whole story, and everything has to be in there, and you know, it, your film is being shown, and you know, we're dying for people to know our real story. So then you you get, you know, what you have to show everything in your film, or for example, Tariq, I will use it as an example. Um, like some of the criticism I, I've had from from Palestinians is, why did you make a character who can't read? We are an educated people. He, he can't read. He doesn't represent Palestinians. I'm not saying Palestinians are not you know, educated, but that's the kind of, some people have that response to it. With Soraya from Salt of the Sea, she was a, she's a really stubborn person, angry. Um, she's not likable all the time. She's very passionate, but she's, you know, her personality is, she's a little, you know, she can be annoying to some people, and you, people, some people love her, and some people can't stand her. She's just a normal person. But you know, I find that people sometimes like why they want her to be like perfect um, because she's representing a Palestinian woman on screen. She has to be perfect. But you can't have characters like that. I mean, I'm not interested in characters like that. I'm, I'm interested in flawed characters, characters that are just normal people. Um, so I think that's like the the burden of you know. I, I, I always say the, nobody symbolizes anything. Nobody represents anything. It's just it's one Palestinian story of millions. One Palestinian, you know, one character of, of millions. Right, and mm. but and and that's that's important what you say, but I think from the perspective of a historian or a, you know a film scholar mm. or such, you you're going to be in the books. You are in the books of you know on the list of Arab women film directors. I think there's only there there are f very few. Anyway, no, there's a lot. F feature film, but <laughs> feature <laughs> film directors. That's okay, what I'm talking about. Okay. I should have qualified that. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of women yeah. involved in filmmaking and documentary yeah. filmmakers, but you know, you're one of the few. So I think I think it's just important. It's it's an achievement. So I want to celebrate this, and you know, it's it's a good thing. But I do I think it's 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 also good that you question maybe the marketing of yourself as as you know gender specific kind yeah. of director. But it's ultimately it's a good thing. Um, and it's you're a, probably a mentor to other people, so th it's it's in, and, and that ties into also what you give back to communities in your teaching. Mm. You teach people to trust their instincts, and you are also you can be a model because you're not a stereotypical. You don't present stereotypes in your films in the characters. You don't present rhetorical uh, messages. You are your films are critical in their own ways. And I run, uh, there's you know a lot of depth in your films, mm -hmm. and which also s 
makes you stand out from mainstream, mainstream uh, film directors, I think. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can you talk about curating? Because you've done some of that. And uh, why, why did you, um, why, how did you get involved with Dreams of a Nation, a uh, Palestinian film project? Before Dreams of a Nation, I, I was, I mean, I was um, living in New York at the time, and I, there were no Palestinian films being screened. And I knew that there were a lot of Palestinian films being made, but they weren't being seen um, in the U.S., and, and especially in New York, where I was living. Um, so I, I, don't know, I started getting involved with local organizations and, and trying to and, uh, you know, bring films of, of, of those filmmakers who are working especially in Palestine who don't have the language or don't have the connections or don't have, like, they're making they're really great works, but they're not, they're not, being, they're not getting out there because they, they don't know how to get them out there and nobody knows how to get to them. Um, so I started sort of collecting films while I was in Palestine and bringing them to New York and, and screening them. And then the sort of idea of the Dreams of a Nation project came along in which we decided we would have um, a festival. This was in 2000 and I don't know, three. three. Yeah, 2003. To screen Palestinian films, films about Palestine or about other things, but by Palestinians. Because there's a lot of films about us by other people, um, but our own voices and our own works. Um, and New York had never had a Palestinian film festival before. Um, so we did that the first, you know, Palestinian film festival in New York, and and all kinds of from from the well-known people like Michelle Khalifa and Elie Sleiman, to people who've never never had screened um, outside of, of Palestine, and it was a it was a real mix of, of documentary, fiction, experimental, animation, um, and it was really it was really great. I mean, it was you know, and 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 what was great, of course, was that the people who came were from all like communities from all you know all over the place. But also for you know, our own audience. We have our audience in Palestine. We also have Palestinians living outside of Palestine. To see their own stories and images on screen for the first time, um, was, that, was really, that was really special. Um, and then I tr we tried to keep that up. But then we took, the, we took the, f the same festival to Palestine, because a lot of the films had not also screened in Palestine. So we had this traveling, you know, in 2004, traveling film festival in Palestine. In Gaza, in you know, in Nazareth, in Yaffa, in, in Ramallah, all over the place, um, because that's also another, which is another thing, is that our own audience is really important. When we're making films, to be see screened to our own audience and to have a discussion with our with our own people, that and that's that's really, you know, a key. I think that you don't make films to screen in film festivals and to be screened abroad. You have to make films and engage your own audience and challenge each other and be challenged as an artist. Um, I th that's, that's maybe the most important thing. So it had many different things. And also to archive, to, to because the Palestinian archive, in, in, you know, for those who know about the archive, there was a Palestinian archive of cinema that was in 1982 in Beirut disappeared. Um, there are a lot of rumors why it disappeared, where it is. Um, but we try to re, you know, re sort of collect those films to find the old films that, you know, that had been lost because there were reels there were in, in some countries. Um, some of those, f those filmmakers were still working. So we tried to recollect some of the archive and also to build the new archive um, and to have it online so that people could access it everywhere. Um, but that's a pr project that takes a lot of resources and money and, and uh, and time, yeah, no, and time, exactly. People who are dedicated to doing that. I started to find it really difficult. I stopped making films for a while because I was working on that, and then I left that and started making films again, but it's, it's. Were you working with uh, Khadija, I think is her name? Khadija uh, Abu Ali, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Habash, Mustafa Abu Ali's wife, and Mustafa Abu Ali, Mustafa Abu Ali himself, Kaisas Bedi, like that whole group there, you know, that was something, actually Mustafa uh, Abu Ali was, uh, when we screened his film, he was one of those early filmmakers, we, we brought him from um, Ramallah to Jerusalem for the screening of his own film for the first time in Palestine. Um, and that was great, I mean, we'd like, we found the film, we decided to screen it, we brought him to, you know, see it, and his, you know, it was, it was really, it was great. <laughs> That makes me think of Azal Hassan's film uh, *Kings and Extras*. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with her? And do you? I know Azal. I know she's a, she's a friend of mine, and, and I know that film. Yeah. 
But it was, yeah, I mean, it was that same period, um, period of like what happened to the archives and us, this generation trying to figure out where the archives are, which is still being, there are many people still doing research on it and trying to, to find those archives, yeah. There, some of them have shown up. People say they're, they're, they've, people say they've disappeared. Some people say they were hidden and, and nobody knows where they were hidden. Um, some people say they're, they're actually now in the Israeli archives in Jerusalem, I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff, so. What kind of advice would you give to young aspiring filmmakers who are Palestinian or not Palestinian, these days, but people who have difficulties and challenges making films, what kind of advice would you give to them? Just do it. <laughs> Just go ahead and do it. No, really, don't wait. Don't wait for anything. Um, don't wait for, don't wait for finances. Don't wait for the perfect time. Don't just do it because we, you have to keep going and you have to keep learning and you're going to make, you know, you just have to go. If you, if you have the story in you, do it. Don't wait. Um, I was wondering why you decided to um, have your latest film through the child's perspective um, instead of, I, I know Salt of the Sea, I saw that and, and very much enjoyed it. Um, and, and why the child's perspective um, is important. Yeah, I, a child's perspective was, I liked m different reasons. One of them is that I didn't live that period um, myself. So there's some freedom that as I, I, have a, I have a child's perspective of that period myself, in a way. I have a, I have a romance about that period, a you know, romantic image of that period, um, like Tariq. And also, I think for me, the film is also, it's a question to that generation. I liked, I wanted to use a child to tell a story because Tarek is very clear. He knows what he wants. He wants to get home. And our message as Palestinians was very clear in the beginning. It, it was clear. Things went really wrong. The film stays in this period where it was still good, where there was still hope, before all the corruption, before everything went really off track, and I felt that with a with a child, um, I could I could have a character who keeps keeps clear, and it's a, in a way it's a question to that generation why why didn't they stay clear, why didn't they stay on that path that Tariq stayed on? It's so simple. The Palestinian question is so simple. The media makes it complicated. Everybody complicates it, and our own people complicated it. We complicated it ourselves. Our own leadership complicated it. So. Tariq for me is, is, that, is that, that sort of, why didn't we stay like Tariq, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two brief questions. The first, I know you mentioned last night after the screening that the story coming from 67 was a personal story for you and your family, but I'm wondering also if there were like practical reasons for doing a story that was based out of Jordan because of your inability to do filming in the West Bank or in other parts of Palestine. Yeah. And the second question is if you were influenced by um, documentaries or the earlier Palestinian films that were made ab about the Fadin during that period and if you watched any of them to, because there was, I've, I've only seen a couple of those documentaries, but some of the scenes especially of like the Fedin getting their photographs taken and stuff really reminded me of some of those documentaries. So I just wanted to see what your influences were. Yeah, I, I love that question. Um, but the first question, practically, yes. I mean, I, the, this came after Salt of the Sea and I was denied entry and I, was, I, I moved to Jordan after Salt of the Sea and I was, I've been living in Jordan five years and I was really depressed. The film came out of depression. It's a hopeful film. Salt of the Sea was a depressing film, but I was feeling good. This was like a hopeful film at the time I was depressed. Um, but, uh, but that was a big part of it, was that um, I was really depressed. I couldn't get back to Palestine, and I wanted to find something hopeful about that and, and to do something as an artist hopeful, not let the depression sort of consume me. Um, and so I found this, this story of, of you know, th this time period, of a hopeful time per period, and of a, of a character who's just, no matter how much he gets kicked down, is, keeps, you know, this hopefulness about him. Um, so I was in Jordan, let's do something good with that. 
Um, and then regarding the second question, I like I love this question because you know, and this comes back to the archives and and gathering those films. And I watched all those films; they are they are totally re re referenced in my film. Um, I wanted to reference them. There are even shots that are referenced right right out of those films that the that those filmmakers were making in the 60s and 70s because I was interested in how they were filming themselves, how they were filming their own lives and their, you know, their own struggle um, because uh, you know, it's, it, they were feeling good. I mean, it was about being empowered, empowered again. So I wanted to shoot it in a way that would reference those filmmakers and that, that, that the sort of mood that was, was happening at the time. Um, so yeah, thanks for, no, yeah, for it noticing. Definitely, <laughs> it definitely seems like there was almost an homage to that. Yeah, it's really absolutely. Like absolutely. It's a, I hope it's an homage to, the, to those guys that were doing. I mean, they were making films, but they were also just recording their lives, too. There's also just tons of, of footage. They were, you know, they were recording their lives, and they were saying, we, are, we refuse to be refugees. We are not refugees. We have agency to, to do something. And you could see that in the language of the, of the, of the camera. Uh, we, have a, oh, we have a question here and then a question back there. Uh, take the one where? Back there, back there. Back there. Helen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Helen. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Anne Marie. Um, yeah. Uh, so, as an artist as well, I'm sort of interested in your comment on um, you made a point of saying that you like to have your films or they should be going back to the Palestinian people so they, they can see their own, you can have these discussions and dialogue and engage and argue and so on and so forth, um, which is very important. Um, sometimes here we have the, uh, the conflict of who comes to see our work as artists, our, our, our own community. Um, and then you feel like, damn, I'm preaching to the choir. And who I really want to see what our point of view are, is are West, other people outside our community. And I, I just uh, find it very interesting that it's, it's such a strong um, point and, and a good point. But I was interested in why that is also with you. Sorry uh, for that. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, like, for example, I mean, coming back to the question of Tariq as a, as a, as a boy, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a, for our own audience, like, this is a question for our leadership, why they went so wrong. We can only ask them th that, and, and so there's a dialogue for, with that. And then I also think it's important that our own community doesn't start to accept cliches that other people have created about our lives, because when you don't see anything else, you know, it's, it, that's important too. I mean, yesterday, I just want to give a small example. Yesterday, um, a woman came up to me, and, uh, a Palestinian woman, and she said, I, you know, in the film, the refugees are really clean. They look really clean. And I was like, you know what, I'm not going to make the film with like the dirty refugees. Like, that's such a cliche, and now we, 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 we believe that cliche. Anyone who, yes, in the film, this, this was the beginning of 67. They were wearing those clothes. Later, this is three years later, maybe they're wearing the same clothes. They were gonna, they're going to look different, but this is like at the beginning, you know. So they're wearing, and and anyone who's been in a refugee camp knows that Palestinians wash and clean. They might have lost everything, but they are clean, mm -hmm. you know. That's that's a fact. So I, you know, and I I was interested in this dis comment from her because it's like we start to believe the cliches mm -hmm. that we see that other people have created. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is also part of like also dialoguing with your own community but I agree with you like as an artist you you have to have a bigger audience than that you have to hope I mean I hope that the film speaks to somebody who doesn't know anything about Palestine doesn't know anything about the situation like they find something in the story that is personal or meaningful to them that's that's the best thing I think an artist can right. can ask for you know so it's both both audiences yeah. Hi, I'm 
to Linda Hanley from the Washington Report, and we do carry your other film that's also the sea, and we hope to carry this um, in our bookstore too. Thank you, me and too. <laughs> <laughs> so distribution, come see us. <laughs> but um, I, I'm kind of following up on Helen's question. Um, what are the restrictions, I mean, why can't you create an exodus-like film for the Palestinians, who, something that's a game changer that, that influences all of America? I think you can do it. I'm <laughs> challenging you to do it. What, what are the obstacles you think you, you face? Other than money. Yeah, money, money, <laughs> finances. No, I think, of course, it's financing to be able to do such a film on such a scale, because you can't do a film like that a film that's like would be such a historically important you cannot do that cheaply because it would look bad it's better not to see it than <laughs> no and and then I, I think i mean look it's it's tough it's tough to get these films even these films to get them made to find support for them internationally i mean it's it's difficult it's difficult to, to you know it's a story that a lot of people don't want to hear um, and we feel it. I feel it as a filmmaker. I feel it again and again. I, we get a lot of blocks. Um, I hope this film, I mean, speaking of distribution, I hope we get U.S. distribution. Salt of the Sea took two years before it found a U.S. distributor. Um, it's, it was right away picked up. The first country that picked it up was India. It was, you know, it was theatrically released in France, in Spain, in Belgium, in Switzerland. But in the U.S., it took two years for that to happen. Um, I hope things are changing. I mean, I'm, I haven't been living here for, for a long time, so I don't have a sense of that. You probably have a better sense of whether something's changing or not. Do you think so? <laughs> yeah. Your film will help it. I hope. <laughs> Let's see. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of obstacles, but like Muhammad said, it keeps getting up. <laughs> On the distribution yeah. question, how yeah. difficult is it to get a film like this latest one on Netflix and di directly bypass theater distribution and the theater channels? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know because, um, I mean, the way like we're dealing, I'll just use an example of how we're distributing it now in the Arab world. Um, because Salt of the Sea, also, we had a, a, a distributor in Dubai buy the film, the rights for the film, the whole Middle East, and then he never distributed it. So with this time, we've kept the Middle East rights with us, and we are going to each, you know, theaters privately ourselves, making deals with theaters um, to screen the film, to make sure that people have a chance to see it, that it gets out there. Um, so it will be released in Jordan in the, s in the summer, it will be re 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 released in Lebanon, in Egypt. I mean, these are small, like, art house theaters, but at least it will, it will screen. Um, this is why I haven't written anything new, because, you know, the filmmaker then be also has to become the distributor. So in the U.S., I mean, things are really changing. I mean, because it's not an Arab issue, it's with all independent cinema. There's a real problem of independent films being seen here and they're getting seen less and less. So people, I think, are trying to bypass, find new ways of, of distribution here. Um, and it's, it's, it's got to happen. I mean, it's happening online, too. I mean, that's, that, there's a lot of freedom in that. I don't, I'm still like a little uneasy with people watching films online legally, not illegally, legally. But that's what everyone says. I mean, that's what the new generation is doing. That's how they're watching films. So you have to go with that, too, and not, not hold on to this old theatrical release only in the theaters. If 15-year-old if, if kids want to, will only watch a film online, then we have to make sure it's online for them. I'm going to ask a question. Um, yeah. Is the film going to be shown at the Chicago Palestine Film Festival? Yes, it is. <laughs> tomorrow, no, tomorrow, Saturday night. Okay. It will be at the Chicago Palestine Festival, and on Sunday there's another screening. Yeah. We have another question up in the front. You know, I noticed that conflict between uh, the boy and his mother, and this is a split personality of a refugee mother who left Palestine. My mother left Palestine proper, what they call Israel now. Uh, she left and she had us in Lebanon. Uh, I remember I was 12 years old when the Fidaiyin started coming online in Lebanon. Uh, they put that Palestine, you know, Palestine is our country, we're going back to Palestine. Uh, at the same time, they didn't want us. You know, they were afraid because they saw the brutality of the other side, and they did not want us. 
to go and train. Yeah. We used to sneak out to go and train. Uh, and that is a conflict, and I think uh, you wrote the script for this yeah, movie. Yes. Uh, you got it right, because I know this is what happened to me with my family, with my parents. Uh, but uh, even though they did not want us to go and carry a Kleshnikov and go fight and whatever, at the same time, they, they really imprinted that Palestine in us. My first time to Palestine was in 1993. When I went at the airport, my sister came to pick me up with her husband, I said, let me drive. And I drove from Tel Aviv to Akka. Mm. The only thing, and all, all the roads, everything was in my mind from what my father and mother told us about, except I thought Palestine was much, 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 and then much bigger than what it is. <laughs> because my father used to tell us the stories that we went from Akka to Haifa, uh, and we went in the morning, we came back at night, because they were going by Hamtur, yeah. and a horse and buggy, not yeah. in a car. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, Palestine is not dying. Yeah. And the arts, and for whoever said uh, that, are we reaching people? Art is like uh, engraving in stone. It stays. It's not going to go away. Your movie will be here after a million years, especially with the technology now. After a million years, the truth will be there. Palestine will be there, and your movie will be there. Thank you for your work. Thank you. <laughs>